Oh, as well. There's one here, so I trust her. Um, so yes, my name is Seija Hirkia, and I'm here today to uh, have a little role-playing game for you. So my role in this in this game is that I pretend to be a data scientist. Oh, well, actually, I don't pretend because that's what I do here at CSC. Uh, although I have a habit of saying that I'm actually a metadata scientist because I don't do data science myself as much as I teach and help others to do it. Um, and that's what you are. You are going to pretend to be the uh, the people who I teach, who I suppose you are because you are sitting in a classroom over there and I'm talking to you here. So it should be also rather easy for you. Um, so indeed, uh, I don't, I should also add here that I don't actually understand this cloud stuff at all beyond the fact that I like it. And uh, what I'm going to do here is that I'm going to show you why I like it and afterwards Olli is going to explain how that was made actually possible and what, what really was happening. So, so yeah, uh, the thing is that I recently gave a course called um, an introduction to data science, or just a day of lectures at the Hame University of Applied Sciences first, and then later again in Kajani. And this this course is actually just a series of lectures, or in other words, me talking for a whole day about all kinds of nice anecdotes that I find interesting and what I have been uh, looking at. I call it a, a sightseeing bus tour because it's not exactly a kind of teaching event where I would actually teach people to really do something. I'm just showing things that there's this thing and there's that thing over there and afterwards you may, uh, the, the audience may go and get more familiar with some kind of things, that, some, some special things there. So I just used some slides with a lot of links and then some examples and, or demos in R Studio. Uh, actually, how many of you know the R language? Almost all of you. That's very nice. Uh, how about R Studio? Almost uh, all of the same people. So I don't actually need to show this to you, but I will. So uh, R Studio is uh, nowadays popular. Looks pretty ugly here. Uh, nowadays popular user interface for the R language looks like this. So this, what I have here on the screen right now, is. A local version, so installed on on this actual computer here, this one. Uh, yeah, so that's what it looks like here. Now, going to show you soon how this is working. So the audience in these two cases, just to give you some uh, some context here, it was rather varied in in who they were and what they knew. So in the first case, they were teachers, and they had a really wide range of skills. So some of them uh, had basically no programming skills at all. In the other end there was this one guy who probably would have driven his car on SQL. Uh, and that, that's, that was his hammer. In the second case I had some kind of computer science students. Uh, students anyway, they were terrifyingly young. Um, but they again then were rather more savvy. The places, the, uh, the actual locations also, which I don't have here on the, on the slide, but in the first case it was a computer class like this. In the second case it was an auditorium without any computer uh, computers or such, which was just fine, which you will obviously maybe realize already why and you will see soon. Now the examples that I had were complete in the sense that they did not require any programming on on behalf of the of the students or the course participants, but uh, since R Studio is the way it is and this R code is the way it is, it left the complete freedom for them to tweak these tweak these examples as much as they wanted. Um, so how this was done? Uh, both the blueprints that Oli is going to explain to you in a moment uh, was used to set up well an R Studio session or a virtual machine running R Studio, ser the server version of R Studio, uh, with a single R code file that I had previously written, and everything stemmed from there. So uh, when I had 
the ability to start R Studio session with this uh, R Studio sessions for everybody with this one single R code file there available, then everything everything else was uh, possible to do in R code. So me being me, practically uh, seeing my dreams in R, it was rather easy from there. So all of these things that I'm going to show you pretty soon uh, were possible to do, and all of this happened with with minimal fuss at the core side. So uh, this what I'm what I'm going to do now is actually going to be pretty authentic, because I haven't prepared anything beyond the course that I had then. So what we're going to see here now, you can by all means do this uh, now as if you were the course participants there. So what we're going to do, uh, we're going to go. You actually should first check your email. Oli has sent you some spam. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or oh, it may have gone to your spam folder. But you have gotten an account and a password for this thing that we're going to go to. Or actually an activation link, so you oh, can save right. your password. Right. Uh, you can use a rather unsafe password for this, so no need to think of a very good one. Afterwards, after you've activated your account, through the activation link that Oli gave you. Uh, just going to give you a few moments, seeing when everybody stops typing. Can you please put your hands up if you have managed to get your account running, if you are even trying? Okay. I got a list from A. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think what's going to happen, I sent you the list, but uh, I think it's going to be the list of the thing. Ah, okay. Okay, well, you can probably pair up with someone who yeah, got an email. Yeah, easier to do that. Right. Now, I can also, if you send me mail, I can send you activation links. Only dot tournament at csc.net. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to type it up here so you can see it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> ah, okay. Let's do it that way. Okay, yep. Easier. Um, well, you can... You should be able to do the... The little toy example. Or, or at least, well, you get to see all the things you are going to see here now. I'm going to go forward so that we don't completely explode our timetable. So you, I'm going to do a slightly different thing that you are going to do. So you should be using this, uh, the email that you were sent the link to, uh, the email that you activated. You should type it here, up, up here where it says email, and then the password that you picked, you should type that there. I'm going to do a slightly different thing. I'm going to go in with this Hakka login, which is what we were doing uh, in these courses, because all of these people that I had as an audience, they all, all had this Hakka access, which made things even more more easy, even easier. So no need to send the links links beforehand for people who are affiliated with the Finnish Academic Institute, like like this. Uh, yeah, um, actually, I think you have, yeah, behind your name tag, you have this, this information about the local, uh, local wireless access. So that should work. Name tag is behind the name. And also there are these other, uh, other things. Also, if you have a new room, it should be available. <laughs> yep. That's, that's really nice, actually. This is, uh, you are all playing the audience really nicely. Thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah. So that, that of course is still an issue. The people who are not at their personal laptop, uh, personal office rooms, uh, they need to have some kind of web ac access. But that's all they need. <coughs> yeah. So while I've been speaking here, you probably may have made the thing. I'm going here. Okay, 
So uh, what opens up is this uh, list of these available blueprints. What you are pretending to be, you are pretending to be at the uh, Kajaani Ammatti Korkeakoulu or the uh, University of Applied Science. So what we're going to do is to click here under the under the title, title KAMK introduction, introduction to Data Science. So you're going to be clicking here, launch new, and this might take now a moment if everybody is doing it at the same time. All is probably looking at the stats, seeing how many are being started, how many how many uh, sessions or virtual machines are going to be uh, running soon. So what we what we're waiting for here. Everything seems to be okay. What we're waiting for here is for, for a button to appear here on where my uh, mouse pointer is, where the access. And obviously this is the point where you're supposed to have the jokes, but I don't. Jukka was quite good at this. Jukka, do you have anything to say? <laughs> Jukka, we need jokes. Usually a lot, but this is so sudden. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, okay, there we go. So. <laughs> Uh, I repeat, all of this is what I would have been, uh, and I have been doing, in the course. So, yeah. But it's it's nice in the start to get get warmed up and for people to get used to my voice and my accent and my outrageous behavior. Uh, so yeah, obviously we're going to be clicking here, open in browser, and we get another uh, login thing. And I understand that this is something rather unfortunate. Oli doesn't like this at all. You can you can explain why and why this is here and how you plan to get rid of it, if you wish. Yeah, if somebody knows the developers of R Studio, let me. <laughs> oh, I've had some complaints about them as well. Uh, yeah, so here you're supposed to type just R Studio like like it is, like you can see there, and then R Studio again, uh, and just to get rid of these guys. Whatever. And then what we get here is it looks exactly like the ordinary desktop version of R Studio, except that it's in a uh, it's in a browser tab. But from now on, I have a full access to to R Studio's uh, uh, properties and all the things that's there. And on top of it, I also have and this is the nice thing that the bootstrapping thing that we have. So here you can see the uh, file name examples.r and that's the file I prepared beforehand with all the examples and so I'm going to click here and RStudio is going to open the contents of that file here uh, in my in my RStudio session like this and from there on I'm I'm on my own ground so to say so this, this way also I had the ability to share the actual um, the actual slides which are behind this rather unfortunate URL. But now that it's here, it's actually possible to copy that and then just go ahead and start a new tab as soon as I find the mouse there and type that in and what you get well, not type copy paste what you get there. Here are the slides for my for my uh, introduction to data science bus tour. If you're interested in any, any of that stuff, obviously it's freely available as long as you know, know the URL, and now you do, so feel free to look at them if you wish. Oh, sorry, wrong place. Uh, actually, I'm going to close that one so that I don't confuse myself anymore. Yeah. So. Okay, so here is my here is my R Studio session. Uh, also, uh, if you prefer the HTML version, it's over there. And at this point, I ask people to, you know, um, highlight all of these lines up to up to line 15. So starting from starting from install packages something something, and to the uh, unzip f name. Once you've highlighted that. You can go here, where it says run. 
and uh, and then you just click here and it's going to run these lines which are my prerequisites for, for running the rest of the examples. So what it's going to be doing, it's going to be downloading one, one additional R package called TreeMap, which I need there, and then attaching all these namespaces. Also, then it's going to go uh, to the web pages of this Finnish town called Hämeenlinna, and their open data about their uh, well, the town of Hamedlin in the year of 2014 was doing all kinds of purchases and these are all, all the records from those purchases that we were using as an example data set in this course. I have a question. What do you mean so many? Hmm? Actually, where is, this, where is the R server running? Actually, right uh, uh, physically in Kajaani. In the, in the cloud I just showed you. All right. So, the actual reason I'm asking is that I see that you are able to install packages. Yeah. Like that. So essentially, you have the options doing that, that the underlying VM. Mm -hmm. uh, these are questions to these people. Yeah, I'm yeah. just like, yes, you can do that. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll, I'll get to that soon. Right. So okay. if you want That's to shift that, you could. Sure. Yeah. It, uh, it's also an educational choice for me to actually show that it's uh, I, I in, in this course. Yeah. The reason I'm asking is that if, even if you restrict that for the user, R usually bypasses that by creating a user specific library for that particular reason, for that particular session. Yeah, but everybody's running their own session, so. And, and actually their own, own, own virtual machine. Right. Actually, Almost, uh, so. But I'll get to that. Right, 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 right. <laughs> see, see, I don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, and actually, that's what, that's what I was trying to say here. I, I don't even care whether I need to install these, uh, install these things or not. Uh, in this case, the, the image actually already comes with uh, quite a long list of pre, not just the base R packages, but a quite a long list of others. So, for example, you, maybe realize the dplyr, ggplot, and ggplot2, and all of these uh, would need to be normally installed as well, but they were already pre-installed. The tree map was not, so I, that one I had to uh, ask for them to install. Um, but for me, that wasn't even the interesting part. <laughs> uh, rather, it was what ha what's happening here. So I, there's this download file, so go to that URL, download the zip file from there, and you realize that they've now appeared here in the um, in the file exp uh, explorer here. And afterwards, I unzipped them in within R, which is nice. And then I then I have all the data here that was needed. And from that on, uh, I started to go through. This, and this comes to, uh, at a certain point, this first example that's starting here, uh, it comes at, at a certain point where I explain how uh, a lot, usually the word, uh, the number that is used is 80% of data science is actually just wrangling with the data. So uh, doing, doing some nice analysis happens at the very end after, work, after you manage to beat your data into submission in several ways. And what, what's happening here at the beginning is me trying to show the complete uh, thought process that I had when I was first getting, getting familiar with this data set and first trying to any, uh, any sort of small, small analysis. So that's, if, if you are looking at this and you understand uh, our code, you realize that I'm going back and forth here, but there's another <laughs> educational purpose for that. Uh, so, if we want, if you want, we can, of course, try and see this example, but we're not here today to learn data science, we are here to learn clouds. So, at this point, I think I move the words, the stage to Oli, and Oli can explain what actually happened behind the scenes. Thank you. I'll first try to find my presentation here. Mm -hmm. Oh, you were already there. 
here. Raw save page as. Okay. Now, is this download? Yes. Doesn't look good. But I can live with that. Hmm. Yeah, let's not worry about this not looking fancy. It's nostalgic. Yes. <clears throat> okay, so is this large enough? Shall I, shall I make it even bigger? Okay. Um, so, both the blueprints. Uh, first, an overview, then uh, a recap of the use case that say I showed you, and then some uh, insights what's there and what's missing the software. Okay, so what is both the blueprints? It's a uh, web interface to resources that you just, or most of you just experienced. I, uh, I wonder if somebody's still missing the uh, activation link I mailed you. You are still missing. Okay, oh, okay good. Um, it's an open source project. It's available at, at GitHub. I can show you the. It's on the CSC for Science, IT Center for Science, uh, both the blueprints. Anyone can run a copy. It's uh, developed in house here. Uh, me and two other people have been mostly involved. Uh, it takes some nice uh, password boxes, like it uses Docker, Angular, builds on a RESTful API. It's deployed by Ansible, also uses Ansible uh, internally. Uh, you do self-service with it. Uh, you can use federated identities, SAML2, and uh, you can serve notebooks like Sir, uh, say I just did. So anything that runs in the web, interactive, uh, with potentially a lot of computational resources behind it, and you can do visualization. I think that's like a, the definition of notebook. Uh, we usually call it PB, which is like British petrol, but the other way around. So, some concepts. Uh, maybe I'll make this a bit bigger. Okay. So, uh, there are system admins and users currently in PB as the user types. And system admins make blueprints like the uh, KM, uh, KAMK uh, blueprint that you just used. Uh, so, they are like templates for templates for uh, individual instances. And users launch those instances uh, and the instances currently can be either virtual machines like the one uh, Kalle deployed, uh, one virtual machine per user, or then containers, Docker containers in this case, uh, for example running individual notebooks as you just tested in the RStudio. So, each of the uh, each of the web interfaces was uh, a Docker container, uh, a private Docker container that had only your processes and files in it. Uh, the instances are time limited and quota limited and completely disposable. So this is good for the admin side, but um, okay. So you, you have to take care that you don't do anything valuable unless you save it to the local host. In the in the notebooks currently, um, all the users are authenticated. Uh, if you don't need authentication, and like to run, for example, Jupyter uh, slash IPython notebooks, temp NB uh, is an excellent project for that. Uh, easier to set up, but if you uh, need uh, authentication, then Blueprints is pretty nice. Uh, and the user accounts are either locally added by admin, so I uh, got your email addresses, 
pasted them in the admin UI, uh, clicked on mul uh, invite multiple users from the system sent multiple uh, individual indi uh, activation links to you and then by clicking that you can uh, activate your account and set a password or then uh, you can use federated identity which we use the Hakka Federation here in Finland that's based on uh, SAML2 Shibboleth uh, basically in Finland we have a pretty nice situation covers all the universities most of the higher education I think. all right and then uh, so this is more or less about the software and we also have deployed a service uh, the PBC CFI that you just tested so we run one hosted instance of the open source project uh, that's currently open to anyone anyone in, in the Finnish higher education using federated identity it's in public beta uh, production planned this year maybe currently it's it does not have the full support structure for example so that uh, uh, it it is being monitored but it's not uh, monitored in a uh, through the CSC's official uh, official processes, it's just a small team that keeps it up and running. Uh, we do have some example blueprints for R Studio and iPython Jupyter notebooks, as you probably saw. There were, was a list of list of notebooks in the UI, um, and as was mentioned, it's deployed in in our IaaS cloud in Seaport, so it basically runs 600 kilometers up north from here in Kajaani. Okay, and then to recap the use case. Uh, so, Seiya played the professor role that wanted to have a, a custom RStudio environment. So what she had to do is she had to prepare a uh, notebook, the examples.r file. Uh, and prepare it so that it actually can pull in more stuff uh, when it's run the first time in the individual containers uh, public sources or uh, semi-public sources um, and then say you have to make it uh, available somewhere in the web so that um, I could make the blueprint as an admin of PBC CFI uh, tweak the blueprint so that when the R Studio is launched, uh, it picks up the uh, picks up the examples.r file uh, and puts it in the uh, container and then launches the container and exposes it to the students. Um, and the student as you noticed, received a link to the system and an activation token if necessary. Uh, then just access the system through the browser, uh, launch an instance and probably learn something. No e-learning system integration here, so if there's like results, uh, if there's some results that need to be uh, exercise is completed and results need to be uploaded somewhere you have to do it manually so basically all the notebook environments provide an option where you can download the current contents to a file and then you could send that to the professor or uh, upload it to a grading system we don't have any integration yet at least yet okay and now the thing that I promised to promise to explain so once you clicked on the uh, create a new instance button under the uh, blueprint, the system um, created a new container, Docker container, and that in turn uh, downloaded the newest version of the lecture notebook. 
say you could have actually updated it five minutes before the course and I did not have to modify the blueprint itself so it's pulled right when you click the launch and instance button uh, okay to run the containers the system actually needs to manage the set of uh, virtual machines so that's the front end uh, and then that handles all the web traffic and then there's a set of VMs that actually are used to hosting the individual containers uh, currently we are running one or two we actually ran out of quota in our project but Kalle is looking into that uh, it's already updated. Ah, okay so we're probably running three virtual machines at, as the back end now okay so containers in, in a pool of VMs managed by the system um, and the system removes the instances when they expire so I guess the RStudio instance has two hours of lifetime uh, and then it's removed unless the student removes it before that uh, it also re recycles the VMs so that uh, just for extra security you once the VM uh, has been exposed to end users, uh, they might be malicious. Uh, it's actually good to recycle that and spawn a new fresh one that we know that it's clean from a clean image. Okay, and then the missing bits. Yeah, permanent storage. So uh, everything is um, ephemeral at the moment. But of course, for any serious work, a permanent session concept would be very good. Uh, okay, uh, it's providing providing storage is a sensitive subject because I think when you do that, the users will inherently. Uh, inherently uh, assume that it's really per permanent on even if you say that don't do any don't put anything valuables on it please make backups oh Ooh. so we're I don't know if it's better but it's fancy <laughs> uh, Ooh, are we running it in Seaport? Yes, yes. Oh, <laughs> cool. Uh, so, um, there you have a, uh, you ha have to have a session concept, save a session, uh, can multiple notebooks share the same session, what gets saved, uh, if things overlap and stuff like that. Okay. Maybe we could just provide examples how to use an external storage, like uh, an own cloud instance, for example, a Dropbox-like, or object storage would be nice. But uh, that's a hot topic. Then another missing bit is user grouping. Uh, Currently, we don't have any structure, just a flag that says if a user is an admin or not. Uh, so, for example, in PBC or CFI, only the CSC uh, admins that administrate the service can be admins, really. Uh, so, groups would be, of course, useful for many things like uh, limiting visibility and creating global blacklist and whitelist. This is the next thing that we're gonna do do for the for both the blueprints. Uh, and then I already touched the group managers. Uh, so in order to scale the service we really need to be able to delegate some of the responsibilities in this case, it would be Seiya. Yeah. Seiya is not an admin in PBC or CFI. She's not a 
technical person in that sense. Which is the reason why I don't actually understand what's happening there. Which is, uh, yeah, how it should be. So we take care of stuff and then she takes, takes care of the science. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and um, so we, we need to introduce another layer of group managers that can uh, pull in uh, groups of users and ca can uh, customize blueprints, for example, in this case, just change the uh, bootstrapping URL for the examples.r in the example. Uh, probably also they can, uh, they will be able to uh, limit the visibility of the blueprints. Now, everything we put in there is public, but uh, I'm sure there will be cases where the material is supposed to stay in within the course. Course participants only. Uh, we don't have any accounting. We do keep logs, but we don't have any automated accounting. So when this goes into production, we all, of course, need to be able to monitor who's running and what. Especially if we, with the addition of group managers, we can, uh, we provide the possibility to, uh, excuse me, to uh, host custom content, content that's only av available for a subset of users. <coughs> okay. And here we are at summary. So it's open source. Uh, anyone can download it. Anyone can install it. Jukka can uh, tell <laughs> how how easy it is. It is. Okay, Copy good. <laughs> At least in Seaport. Yes. Okay, and then we have the service PBC and CFI. It's in pilot or beta. And that's limited to low, uh, notebooks. Uh, it's open for Finnish researchers and students. Uh, clarification, when I said limited, uh, I mean that the only plugin or instance type that we in have enabled in PBC and CFI is a notebook, so Docker containers. Uh, you can also provision uh, the individual virtual machines through PBC CFI so that a uh, user can launch a virtual machine. Uh, okay, uh, the whole chain goes that user logs into PB, <laughs> uploads his uh, her uh, public key there, uh, launches a virtual machine, the virtual machine is uh, exposed to the IP where the user comes in from and the SSH key is automatically put in so that you get private VMs there. They are also time limited. For this public service uh, with open access, we really cannot do that since uh, that would potentially need quite a lot of resources to run it. We can run uh, 20 containers on a small <coughs> VM pretty easily. But VM is a VM if you have per user VMs. That would be just a bit more expensive. And I say thank you.